Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku had Iron Man Quirk Part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 3rd comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content and live a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story by Kayadon from fanfiction.net So let's start the video. In a dilapidated and abandoned apartment building, seven criminals were in the middle of a sale. And the product being sold, Midoriya Industries Hardware. Why'd the price go up? It's almost twice as f much as it was last time. One of the buyers asked, clearly not happy about the increase in price. Hey hey calm the f down. One of the sellers said. Ever since that prick overhaul snitched on us and told Midoriya what was going on, he's made a lot f harder to sneak this stuff out. Less supply, more demand. One of the other sellers summarized. Don't help that the F-er is going around in a goddamn suit of armor hunting down any F-er with his tech. The third seller said. Ah, bullshit that rich F probably can't fight his way out of a paper bag. The buyer who said that leaned up against the wall and tried to light a cigarette with fire that came out of his finger. I bet that BSTRD won't last another day before some villain worth his salt kills him. I could probably do it. Crash. Suddenly Azuka's armored arms smashed through the wall the villain was standing behind and grabbed him, before pulling him through the wall and throwing him through another wall. Tsichti. He's here. Izuka's targeting system went to work, and before the villains could recover from the shock of Izuka's arrival, he had already raised his arm. Firing three blasts that hit the villains head-on, sending them flying back and into unconsciousness. One of the villains tried to use his quirk, spitting at Izuku. Boom. The saliva landed on Izuku's chest plate and immediately exploded, creating a small amount of smoke that covered his upper body. Did I get him? The villain asked. In response to that question, Izuku walked forward through the smoke. Barely even a scratch on his armor. Ah SHT, the villain said, he tried to get himself ready to spit again, but Izuku suddenly rushed forward at astonishing speeds and grabbed him by the throat. Ah. The other two villains got out their guns and fired at Izuku, however it predictably did nothing to him as the bullet simply bounced off his armor. Izuku backhanded the guy to his right, sending him flying, before punching the other guy in the face, sending him through a wall. With only one goon conscious and gasping for breath in his grip, Izuku decided it was time to get some answers. Izuku let him go, and the goon fell on his knees gasping for air. Where did you get these? Izuku pointed to the crate full of his tech. In response, the villain tried to use his quirk, but before he could spit at him, Izuku light kicked him in the face, causing him to fly back and smash his head against a wall. Ah! The villain cried out in pain, both his nose and head were now bleeding. Tsichti! Uf, just tell me where you got them and we can get you to a hospital, Izuku told him, F off I'm not telling you SHT, the thug said, before again trying to use his quirk. Pew. Izuku blasted the thug with a repulsor blast, knocking him out. He sighed. None of them are talking. Maybe I need to ask Kaken for some advice on interrogation outside of the suit. There were a few things that Achiko said he had to do if he wanted to keep being Iron Man. One of them was that she had unrestricted access to his helmet's camera feed. Although Izuku would have done that anyway. And if she saw him talking to Bakugo right no oh boy. It would not be pretty. Hero incoming. Sun Eater. Izuku sighed. He had a feeling he knew what Tamaki wanted to talk about. And it was not a conversation he was looking forward to. After a few moments, Tamaki walked into the room. Entering through the hole Izuku had made in the wall. You know you're going to have to pay for this right? Tamaki asked. I bought the building the second I saw them walking into it, Izuku explained. I'm planning on tearing it down but I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. Maybe a new office for my legal team. They've been working overtime lately. Izuku. Tamaki tried to speak up. Oh. Looks like the police have found a warehouse full of my stolen tech and are engaging with a firefight with the villains inside. Izuku couldn't believe his luck. 
I gotta go let's talk later bye. Tamaki tried to say something but Izuku simply charged through the wall and flew away. The hero sighed, before growing wings and following the CEO. A few minutes later at the warehouse. When Tamaki caught up to Izuku he found him flying above the crime scene in question. Staring down at the police and criminals engaged in a firefight. He felt conflicted. It was obvious that Izuku was analyzing the situation which was good. Given what he knew of Izuku, he expected him to come flying in headfirst to try and save as many people as possible. Izuku was a smart man. That much was obvious, but he was incredibly passionate about saving people and was rather careless when it came to his own safety. And while it wasn't a bad thing to want to save people, that kind of recklessness could often make things worse. So he was glad that his friend managed to restrain himself. On the other hand he still really didn't have any business being here. Sure, he had that fancy suit. But power was not all it took to be a hero. And Izuku had none of the training required to be a pro-hero. But he did manage to take down the Yakuza, even if he had help. And Blizzard too. Maybe I should give him a chance. Tamaki thought. I don't think I would be able to convince him to go away right now. With his mind made up he flew next to Izuku. What's the situation? Four police cars are blocking the way out. Seven policemen are still fighting and one is injured and hiding behind the car. A total of 30 hostels in total with 11 outside firing at the police and the rest are inside loading up a truck with as much tech they can fit in there. They've got one guy strapped to the front of the truck, I think they're going to try and use his quirk to break through the police barricade. Izuku summarized. You take the people outside, I'll stop the truck, Tamaki said ready to start fighting. No need. Compartments opened up on Izuku's shoulders, and missiles launched out of them towards the villains outside. Boom. 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 Ah. Wah. The rockets crashed into the villains, hitting their marks and sending the shooters flying. Let's go get that truck, Izuku said before flying towards the warehouse. Tamaki followed suit and quickly looked for an entrance other than the front door. After all, it might be trapped and crash. Izuku had already made an entrance by just flying through the concrete wall. The armored billionaire opened fire with his repulsor blast, first striking the truck's wheels. Making sure it wasn't going anywhere. CRP he hit the truck. One of the thugs said. Ah. Tamaki flew in and grabbed a villain with his tentacles, before SWNGNG him around to hit some more of the goons. Izuku started shooting out repulsor blasts at the villains, hitting and knocking most of them out with ease. One of the villains suddenly bulked up, and took the repulsor blast head on, only getting minor burns. Ra. The villain charged towards Izuku. Endurance quirk. You got him. Izuku asked Tamaki as he flew into the air to keep from getting attacked. Yeah. Tamaki shot out his tentacles at the villain, which wrapped themselves around his upper body. Ocean's Wrath. Suddenly electricity surged through the tentacles, shocking the villain in their grasp. Ah. The villain shouted out in pain as he was shocked to. Hell and back. Once he was sure the villain was unconscious, Tamaki stopped his attack and unwrapped his tentacle from around the villain, letting him fall to the floor. Another villain tried to sneak up behind Tamaki while he was seemingly not paying attention, however, Tamaki wasn't in the top 10 heroes for nothing, and when the villain went to punch Tamaki, the hero simply turned his hand into a hard shell and backhanded the villain in the face. Sun Eater decided to watch as Izuku took care of the three remaining villains. To be fair it's not like I'd take long, they were all shooting at him but it was clear it was a losing battle for them. A few blasts later and all the villains were taken care of. Is that everyone? Tamaki asked. No, there's still the one on the truck pretending to be unconscious. Izuku raised his arm and blasted the last villain. Now that's the last of them. Alright. Then let's let the police handle the rest. Tamaki advised. I need to ta dash, how are things with Nijire? Izuku asked suddenly, desperately to prolong the inevitable conversation they would be having. 
Nijairai. Tamaki blushed slightly before shaking his head and refocusing. Izuku, please don't try to change the topic dash, wait. Izuku shouted. I have to go to therapy. I have an appointment in five minutes and Achiko will kill me if I miss it. Sorry, gotta go. Izuku took off, flying through the hole he made and into the sky at max speed. Tamaki sighed. At least he's going to therapy. He wouldn't be able to follow him at that speed. He doubted anyone but Hawks, Ida and Mirio would. Meaning that all attempts to talk to him while he was wearing that armor would most likely be met with the same kind of evasion. Meaning he would have to talk to him while he was outside the armor. As Tamaki was thinking of the best way to go about that, he suddenly felt his phone vibrate in his pocket. He took it out and found a text message waiting for him. A message from Achiko. I'm sending this message to all of our friends. I'm sure you're all probably trying to talk to Izuku and he's definitely avoiding you like the plague. I'm having a dinner party at the manor tonight. Be there at 8. We'll all talk. P.S. Izuku doesn't know about this yet. The text read. Yeah, that seems about right. Tamaki thought. Achiko was typically not one to beat around the bush. If she wanted something done then she pursued that goal relentlessly and wasted no time doing so. Unless of course, it was a matter of her personal feelings. In which case she might just put it off for as long as possible. I'll have to get my good clothes. I hope there aren't too many people there. Tamaki nervously thought as he left the scene. Sometime later. Izuku walked into the bedroom. Tired as hell. As it turns out, doing hero work was extremely physically demanding, especially when said person had little experience doing such work. Who knew? The moment he reached his bed he collapsed and fell face first onto his sheets. Oh, Achiko's going to get mad about me getting sweat all over the sheets. Gosh, maybe I should try going down to the spa for once. Oh, I've never been so happy to be rich. Izuka groaned. He closed his eyes, and slowly drifted off into unconsciousness. A few hours later. Izuku. Izuku heard as he started to wake up. Izuku. Achiko. Yep, that's definitely Achiko. Ah. My body still hurts. I want to sleep. Izuku thought. Izuku. Wake up. Achiko said, louder than before. Slowly Izuku opened his eyes and was met with a sight that swiftly woke him up. Achiko was dressed up in her casual party wear. The clothes she wore when they had friends over. Expensive, yet comfortable, the white dress only enhanced her already obvious beauty. Of course, Izuku was always happy to look at Achiko in that dress, but that did beg the question of why she was in it. Come on you need to get dressed. She gently nudged him. We're having a dinner party. I invited all our friends over so no need to get too dressed up. Well if the dress didn't wake Izuku up, that certainly did. He jolted up with eyes wide. Dinner party. This was not good. This was very not good. Izuku was never a fan of parties, even ones that were attended by his friends. He just wasn't good at dealing with people. And this was a party where basically every attendant was very interested in having a conversation with him. A very specific conversation he had been trying to avoid. What? When? Why? Izuku asked in rapid succession. I started planning it after we agreed to let you keep doing the Iron Man thing, Achiko explained. I was just waiting for an opening in my schedule. Why didn't you tell me? Izuku asked his mind in full panic mode. Because you would have tried to avoid it or argue against it or something like that. Achiko put her hands on her hips and gave him a scolding look. Like you've been avoiding everyone else for these past few weeks. Izuku cringed and turned away from Achiko's gaze. I haven't been avoiding everyone, I've just been busy. Oh don't give me that. Achiko instantly called out his lie. You didn't want to hear everyone tell you what a bad idea this is, so you've been avoiding all of our friends. Don't think I didn't notice you not picking up anyone's calls or responding to anyone's messages. 
Izuku didn't have a defense for that. Listen, these conversations are going to happen. So instead of each one of our friends individually hunting you down and scolding you, we can save everyone some trouble and all come around a table and talk like adults. Achiko took Izuku's hand, calming and comforting him slightly. And you'll have me and Eri there to support you. Eri's coming too. Izuku knew Eri wasn't good with new people. Or people that weren't them in general. So he wasn't sure taking her to a party was the best idea right now. She needs more exposure to people. Good people. Achiko told him. And if it gets too much for her, then you too can leave and you can put her to sleep. It'll give you a good excuse to leave early too. M. Izuku still wasn't sure about that. He was super protective of Eri and the thought of her being uncomfortable for even a second caused him to want to usher her away and hold her in his arms and tell her that she's safe. She'll be okay. We can't keep her locked up in the house like a princess forever. Eventually, she'll need to talk to go outside and talk to people. Achiko reassured him. And she's gonna have to get used to these fancy parties if she decides she wants to inherit the company. Do you think she'll want to? Izuku asked her. Of course, Izuku and Achiko would gladly hand over the company to Eri one day. But that was only if she decided she wanted to become CEO of Midoriya Industries. If she wanted to become something else, anything else, they would support her. If she just wanted to live a peaceful life doing absolutely nothing they would support her still. It was all up to her. I don't know. We'll see. Achiko told him. Anyway, their attention will probably be on you for the most part so she'll probably just sit there and watch us for the most part. Somehow that only barely gave Izuku and comfort. Now get dressed. Achiko pulled him up off the bed. Or do you want the katsudan to get cold? Well, at least there would be katsudan. Sometime later. Sat around a large dining table in the dining room of Midoriya Manor, were a whopping 16 people. Going to you, A, and being the biggest creators and suppliers of support. Gear, you tend to make a lot of pro hero friends. Izuku and Achiko were of course sitting close to each other with Eri right in between them. And right next to Achiko was Ajui. Tsuyu was a friend Achiko had made back in their first year of you. Uh, they had been grouped together on a project involving both the hero course and the business course, and they had remained friends ever since. Next to Izuku was Kirishima. Izuku had been tasked with making support gear for him back when he was at UA and Kirishima decided to befriend him mostly out of pity. Mina was sat next to him, she was Kirishima's girlfriend and a friend of Ajui so it had only made sense that it she befriend the two of them at some point. Tamaki, Mirio, and Nijire were all sitting next to each other with Tamaki right in between the two of them. Shoto Todoroki was also in attendance. Izuku had also been assigned to make gear for him as well. The two of them didn't get along at first. And they really didn't get along for a while, but one day, something changed, and the two were suddenly good friends. Izuku had kept the reason a secret for the most part, with the sole exception being Achiko, who he told basically everything. Momo was sat directly next to him, due mainly to Achiko's and Mina's insistence. Momo had actually met them due to business. She had seen great potential in Izuku's gear and invested in them. This led to them eventually becoming close friends, mainly due to Achiko wanting to secure a business relationship. Jiro was someone they had met through Momo. Izuku and Achiko had been fans of her music and when they heard Momo was close friends with her, they, and by they I mean Achiko, were eager to meet her. Kendo was also someone they had met through Momo back when Achiko had been trying to make as many hero friends as she could to bolster the company's sales and image. Kaminari was a friend of Jiro, and therefore a friend of theirs. Toru was friends with Mina, Ajui, Momo, and Jiro, so again it was only natural they would become friends as well. Shinso was the only friend Izuku had actually sought out on his own. He wanted to help him get into the hero course, and thanks to Izuku's support gear, he did. Naturally, the two of them were very good friends, although Shinso was a teacher at U, now on top of being a pro hero, so he was busy most of the time. Lastly, sitting as far away from Izuku as possible, was Mei. Izuku had insisted they invite her, 
as he considered her one of his friends. To her credit, she did clean herself up, but only because it's been a long-established rule that Mei was not allowed inside their house unless she was sufficiently clean. All right. Achiko started the conversation. So now that everyone is here let's dash, where is it? Mei couldn't hold herself back anymore. I need to see it. What does it run on? How does it maintain such incredible structural integrity while maintaining such high mobility? How dash, you can see the goddamn suit after we're done Hatsumi. Achiko sighed while she rubbed her head. May seemed unsatisfied with that, but she decided to sit down and stay silent anyway. Last time she annoyed Achiko too much she kicked her out the house, literally. Before we address the massive armored elephant in the room, can I just congratulate the two new parents here? Mina said, gesturing to Eri, making the horned girl shrink into her chair. Yeah I knew you two would probably have kids at some point, but you go to skip the baby phase and go right into the cute kid phase. Toru squealed. And she is so cute. I suppose congratulations are in order, Momo said politely. I am very happy for the two of you and I must agree with Toru she is very adorable. Like Toru said I thought you two might have kids but I thought you'd have well you know. Kirishima tried to find a way to explain it, without doing or saying anything inappropriate in front of Eri. Well just because they adopted a kid doesn't mean they're not gonna have one the old-fashioned way. Kaminari pointed out. I mean they have the money and we all know they're doing it on the back. Jiro stabbed Kaminari with one of her jacks. Not in front of the kid. Thank you Jiro, thank you all. Eri is a precious new addition to the family. She's a bit shy right now so let's move on shall we? Achiko said, taking the focus off of Eri. I think it's time we stop dancing around the reason we're all here. Shoto turned directly to Izuku. What the hell are you thinking? Yes as both your friend and as someone who has vested interest in your company, I have to address my concerns with Izuku going around committing what is basically vigilantism, and only not getting arrested because of a legal loophole, Momo explained. Achiko looked like she wanted to laugh. Come on Yamamo. You know we'll be fine. Sure the increase in security has caused a significant decrease in revenue, but we're still making more money than any of our competitors could dream of making. And as for Izuka's Iron Man thing, surprisingly enough, while many people have predictably gotten upset, there is an almost equal amount of people that are actually praising Izuku for taking responsibility for the harm out tech has caused and trying to help, and even more, people just don't care. And even those people who are against Izuku's not vigilantism, still buy our products. So in the end, any changes made to our sales because of Izuku, are negligible. Well I'm glad your sales aren't hurt, but Izuka definitely will get hurt, if he keeps doing this, Kendo added. Yeah we may make it look easy, but hero work requires a lot of training and strong work before you can even think about going onto the field. Nijire said. Didn't class 1A gets attacked by an army of villains and defeat all of them in, like, the first few weeks of their training? Achiko asked. And we all almost died. Kaminari pointed out. Because of that freaking Nomu. A Nomu which is a genetically designed villain. Not something you're likely to run into, especially because you destroyed all the Nomus and killed their creator. Achiko reminded him. Izuku's fighting criminals on a level with the guys you fought at the USJ, except he's doing it in an invincible suit of armor that has enough firepower to blow up a city block. Wait can he actually do that? Kirishima asked the question that interested many of the people present. Well no in one attack. Although the uni beam would be capable of taking down several skyscraper-sized buildings in one attack, assuming the buildings are right next to each other and don't have any properties that would allow them to survive nuclear attacks. Although an attack of that scale would completely drain the suit of power and leave me a sitting duck. Does that count for both the primary power source and the backup power source or just the primary power source? May asked. There is no secondary power source, Izuku said, surprising May. Adding a secondary power source would make the suit bulkier, causing it to become both less maneuverable and easier to hit. And due to the potency of the primary power source, adding a secondary power source just causes more problems than it solves. 
Okay, we're getting into crazy tech talk and kinda straying away from the topic. Mirio chimed in. No no, Izuku, why don't you explain the suit's capabilities, Achiko told him. Well, the suit is powered by a classified piece of technology more potent than anything else available in the world, especially at its size, and is capable of powering the suit for a full three days provided that the suit doesn't make use of the repulsor beams, flight systems or uni-beam. Speaking of the flight system, the suit is capable of flying at around supersonic speeds, however control over the suit at such high speeds would decrease drastically. While not flying the suit is still capable of going at around 90 miles per hour at max speed although it would still require about 2 minutes of running in order to reach max speed. As for offensive capabilities the suit contains two wrists mounted repulsor beams, which at full power could cause significant damage to Kirishima while he's not using his unbreakable form, and are greater in power than Ground Zero's AP shot, 20 homing rockets which are capable of taking out any opponent possessing average durability instantaneously, a missile possessing the power of the average Ground Zero explosion, shin flares that can cause minor burn damage to close opponents but are more meant to flash and cause temporary loss of sight, the suit also possess enhanced strength, allowing the user to lift about 15 tons and punch with the force of 5 elephants, not accounting for any added force from acceleration. Lastly, the Uni Beam is a weapon capable of, on average, dealing damage comparable to Ground Zero's most powerful blast, and at full power could even match the power of a single one of All Might's full power punches. Although it uses up a lot of power, Durability-wise the armor is itself could take one or maybe two hits from Mirio before being completely destroyed, however the person inside would likely take serious damage after one punch from Mirio, and the person inside the armor could only safely take one full power blast from ground zero before they start getting hurt themselves. It's immune to heat any level below the surface of the sun and is capable of functioning even through extreme cold. It's completely waterproof and has its own oxygen supply that could last for about a day, and is highly resistant to electricity as well as other elemental attacks. Lastly, the helmet contains a highly advanced HUD, capable of showing the full status of the armor and giving access to all the scanners, including Dash, Izuku was talking at such intense speed that the only people who could understand him were Achiko, Mirio, Nijire, and Mei. Okay stop. Stop. Mina shouted. It feels like my brain is going to explode. Yeah I'm gonna be honest dude, I only got like half of that, Kaminari said. But we get the point. It's an extremely powerful suit. Shoto said. But that only begs the question Dash, where are our super suits? Toru asked, yes I'm aware that you are halting the production of new products, but shouldn't you still allow custom orders of these armors to trustworthy heroes like you have in the past? Momo asked. Well, there is a big problem with the armor that keeps it from becoming purchasable anytime soon, Achiko explained. In order to properly operate the suit, you'd have to be a genius yourself. It would take years of training for even the most intelligent heroes, excluding Nizu, to learn how to safely pilot the armor. So Denki's not getting one anytime soon, Jiro commented with a smirk. Hey! Kaminari said, sounding offended. In time we could find a way to simplify the controls and the HUD, but that would take many years of development and testing, Izuku explained. Sorry. That aside, it doesn't matter how powerful your suit is, if you are inexperienced that power, you'll end up causing more harm than good, Azui said, making a very good point. Oh, I took that into account when I decided to do this, Izuku said. The armor informs me of any possible dangers my actions could pose to people or objects around me. Todoroki spoke up. Yes but dash, guys, I didn't bring you all here so you could try and talk Izuku out of this. Achiko interrupted. I tried that, and it didn't work. So what chance do you think the rest of you have? That actually caused them to quiet down. They were all well aware that Achiko was the one who wore the in their relationship. Izuku rarely ever objected to what she said, and it was even rarer that he ever won an argument with her. So if Achiko was adamantly against this, and Izuku was still doing it, it didn't bode well for their chances. Uh, can I say something? Tamaki spoke up, much to the surprise of everyone else. Of course. What's on your mind Tamaki? 
Mirio asked his friend. Tu was with him today. While he was fighting. He was pretty good. No innocents got hurt. No unnecessary property damage. He didn't even get hurt. Tamaki informed them. He's been doing this for a few weeks now. And nothing went wrong. I think he at least deserves a chance at least. Everyone stayed silent and took that in. The statement held a fair amount of truth. In the few weeks Izuku had operated, he performed with absolute efficiency and achieved complete victories. No civilians got injured, he himself never got injured, no villains ever escaped him, and while there was a little property damage, it was ultimately minor, and Izuku had paid for it all. All in all, it seemed like Tamaki had a point. I mean, we're not gonna convince him anyway so I don't see any more point in arguing, Jiro said, finally taking a bit out of some of her food. Well if there's nothing we can say to convince you, I guess Jiro's right. No point in arguing. Mirio shook his head. But if your fancy scanners tell you that an enemy is too tough for you, then don't fight them. Call for help. For the most part, it seemed like many of them had accepted this. With a few exceptions. I still don't like this, Karo. So you said. Neither do I, Momo added. Todoroki didn't say anything, he just sat there with his arms crossed looking very unsatisfied. Well, you're not gonna get anywhere moping about it, Achiko told them. Now come on eat up. This meal cost more than most of you makes in a month. And more than Hatsum will make ever. That's because you don't pay me. Hatsumi pointed out while digging into her meal. Your payment is still having access to our resources despite the fact you keep blowing things up. Achiko reminded her. And despite the fact that you make her hella jealous, Mina smirked. For the last time, I am not jealous. Achiko pouted, her face red with anger. Oh, boy here we go again, Mirio said, with several others having similar thoughts. I have no reason to feel jealous. He's my husband. Achiko said, emphasizing that Izuku was hers. You really don't. May sighed. It took her a while to figure out that Achiko was jealous of her, and by a while I mean years, and she still wasn't sure why. Apparently, it had something to do with all the times she'd taken Izuku's measurements. According to all most people, you weren't surpassed to touch a member of the opposite SEC in their private areas. Especially if they were married. God she still remembered when Achiko had caught her in an NTMT position with Izuku after they'd gotten married. She both sent her to the hospital and made her work to pay her hospital bills. That woman was ruthless. Right. Isn't that right Eri, our daughter? Achiko turned to Eri. Eri seemed very uncomfortable, but was keeping herself together by scooting next to Izuku. Seeing this snapped Achiko out of her, totally not, jealous rage. Uh, Izuku, why don't you take Eri to bed, Achiko told him. Right, Izuku said, also noticing Eri's silent distress. He picked her up and started walking. Out of the room. Sorry I have to leave so soon. No, it's fine. Good night Eri, sorry for making you uncomfortable. Mirio apologized. Everyone else gave similar goodbyes as Izuku walked out of the room completely. Once they got far enough away, Izuku asked Eri something. Why didn't you tell me it was getting too much for you? I'm sorry. I didn't want to disappoint you. Eri said in a quiet voice. Eri. The fact that you came out and went to the dinner in the first place makes me very, very proud. Izuku told her. You've been so strong so if you feel like it's too much for you, please tell us. We love you so much and we want you to be happy. Eri started crying from the amount of affection she was being given. She felt like she would never get used to all the love her parents gave her. And that she would never be worthy of it. Eventually, the two of them reached Eri's room. It was, as to be expected, extremely large. It was filled with toys, most of which were unplayed with, and a large, luxurious bed. And of course, the room was right next to Izuku and Achiko's. As Izuku laid Eri down in her bed, Eri asked him a question. 
Can you sleep with me tonight? Ari hated that she had to ask that. She still felt a little overwhelmed and shaken from the dinner, but she didn't want to inconvenience Izuku anymore. Of course Ari. Izuku took off his shoes, and some of his more uncomfortable overwear and laid down next to her. There were a few moments of silence, Ari asked him another question. Daddy. Ari asked him. Why don't they want you to be a hero? Well there's a lot of reasons. But mostly because it's not safe. Izuku told her. It was at this moment that Izuku realized, that he never asked Eri what she thought of all this. Would she think that he's cool for taking down bad guys like Overhaul? Or would she want him to stop because she didn't want to risk losing him? Eri what do you think? Do you want me to keep being Iron Man? Izuku asked her, somewhat fearful of the answer. If Eri told him she wanted him to stop well he'd never feel right putting on the armor. Eri stayed silent for a few moments, before giving her answer. I don't want to lose daddy but. Overhaul was strong. Really strong. I didn't think anyone could beat him but you did. You're stronger than Overhaul I think daddy can beat anyone. Tears started washing down Izuku's cheeks, as he held Eri closer to him. Thank you. Well, now he couldn't stop. No matter what. If his daughter thought he could beat anyone. Then he'd just have to make sure to prove her right. And he would never give up. Nis Kao walked into her luxury apartment after a long day of serving as one of the top bodyguards of the Midorias. She quickly slammed the door behind her and shut every lock in a quick but thorough manner. Afterward, she moved swiftly to her bedroom, slamming the door behind her again. Nis went over to her vanity and pulled open one of the drawers, and retrieved a phone. She dialed in a number and instantly someone picked up. Mask. Said a deep voice on the other side. Sir, Nis responded. I have news on the Izuku Midoriya situation. Go on. The voice told her. Midoriya's friends and wife have all failed at dissuading him from his actions, it appears he will continue his so-called, Iron Man project for the foreseeable future, Nis reported. I see. DMN that Chisaki. We were all profiting just fine off of Midoriya's technology but he had to get greedy and inform him of our actions. Growled the voice, before whoever it was quickly regained their composure. If Midoriya isn't going to listen to logic. Then we'll just have to show him the dangers of playing hero. Whiplash should show him the flaws in his logic. You're going to kill him, sir. Knees asked. Hopefully not. I only intend on having Whiplash scare him. His inventions are too useful. The person responded. However should he persist in his foolishness, then we will have no choice but to end him. But what if Whiplash fails? Nies asked. Whiplash has fought seasoned veteran heroes. Midoriya is simply a pretender in a powerful suit. He will not fail. The person responded. Speaking of which, why have you not acquired the designs for the Iron Man suit yet? I thought I told you that was of the utmost importance. I apologize sir, but it's too heavily guarded. I only managed to get to the computer where the designs were held once, and I couldn't break the digital defenses. It would most likely require someone on Spymaster's level. Nies explained. Hmm then perhaps we should prioritize that rather than Midoriya. The person said. I wouldn't sir. The Iron Man suit may not be as useful as you think. Nis nice said. It requires someone with an extreme level of intelligence to operate it, otherwise they would simply hurt themselves. I see how disappointing. Still, I would like those designs. Our friends at Hammer may be able to make them more useful to us one day. The person said. Nis nice scoffed. Doubtful. Regardless, I'm sending Whiplash to transport a shipment of Midoriya's technology. The person stated. I'll make sure it's easy to find. Yes sir, Nis nice said. If that is all, then I will leave you to your work. The person said. Do not disappoint me. Of course sir, Mice nice said. I will not fail you. Two days later in Izuku's home lab. Alright sorry about the wait, here's your armor. 
Izuku handed Mirio a suitcase. Thanks. Just in time too. Mirio smiled brightly as usual while taking the suitcase. I still can't thank you enough for these. Oh, you shouldn't thank me too much, like I said Melissa pioneered the technology one just made some adjustments, Izuku told him. Anyway, while you're in America, try not to go over a hundred percent. I know you like to plus ultra and everything, but me and Mei are here and Melissa's on I Island, so no one will be there to repair your gear if it gets broken. I make no promises. Mirio teased, only half joking. And try not to get into any trouble while I'm gone. I uh, make no promises. Izuku awkwardly laughed as he returned the half joke. Birrr. 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 Unauthorized shipment of technology detected. The alarm on Izuku's computer sounded. Deploy armor. Izuku said almost instantly as a cylinder in his lab opened up revealing his armor. Hey I could go with you if you want, I'm sure we could wrap this up before my flight leaves. Mirio offered. No, no I've got this. If you miss another flight because of something like this your PR agent might actually kill you. Izuku told him. Mirio cringed at the thought. Yeah you're probably right, still remember if you need help you can always call Tamaki and Nijire. Don't get in too over your head. I'll be fine, Izuku reassured him. Now go. Mirio nodded, before running out the door at super speed, kicking up winds behind him. Leaving Izuku alone with the armor. Alright, time to go. Izuku steeled himself for battle. Seven minutes later. After a couple minutes flying at top speed, Izuku slowed down when he reached the signal that his stolen tech was emitting. At a warehouse near the harbor. Looks like the technology is being stored inside that truck, Izuku noted. He landed down behind the truck and scanned it. Scanning one heat signature detected. Izuku looked at his scanners and realized that not only was his tech inside the truck but so was someone else. And that was all Izuku could deduce before suddenly an energized WHP wrapped around his helmet. Wah! The WHP threw Izuku. Around, cutting through the side of the truck and tossing Izuku to the side. Crash! Ah! Izuku grunted as he crashed through the concrete wall and into the warehouse. Ow! Izuku pulled himself up slowly and noticed that someone was walking in through the hole Izuku made. He looked up and saw the villain in question. They were intimidatingly tall and had red hair, but that was all Izuku could see past the armor he was wearing. Armor made his stolen tech. He had two by his side, crackling with blue energy. That doesn't belong to you. Izuku growled as he got up and shot two repulsor blasts from his palms at the villain. The villain moved his swatting the two blasts into nothing, and striking Izuku in the chest. Ah! Izuku was sent flying back a few feet, but before he could hit the ground he activated his repulsors and stopped himself in the air. Izuku distanced himself from the villain, flying as far back as far up as he could in the enclosed space they were in. He swatted away my repulsor blast. Even at that level of power the reaction time and precision needed for that is insane. Izuku noticed the dent in his armor from where the villain hit him. He even dented my armor. Scan villain data banks, Izuku told his armor. I have to know who this is what I'm working with, villain recognized. A rank villain, whiplash. Quirk energize. Allows the user to cover objects in blue energy, increasing their power and making them deadly weapons. However, this normally causes those objects to degrade in durability and fall apart. The armor read off the villain's file. Any loss of durability in that Izuku asked the armor hoping he found a weakness. None. The armor quickly dashed Izuku's hopes. They must have used my tech to make that move the energy around within them. This would keep them from degrading. Izuku grit his teeth with frustration. If I just use more repulsor blast he'll block them. Let's see what happens when you try to WHP this. Izuku raised his arm and a missile rose up from the armor ready to fire once Izuku's targeting system locked onto the villain. Before Izuku's targeting system could finish, however, Whiplash swung his WHP at Izuku, 
forcing him to dodge as the WHP just missed his arm. But that wasn't all, Whiplash maneuvered the WHP, causing the tip to suddenly veer to the left, and just barely hit the missile. Kaboom! Aghai! Izuku shouted as he was knocked out of the air by his own explosion and smashed against the wall of the building once more. The armored hero groaned as he groggily pulled himself out of a wall, the explosion going off so close to his head left him stunned and momentarily out of it. But a moment was all Whiplash needed, as he flung his at Izuku. Ah! Izuku cried as the wipes hit his back, causing visible damage to his armor. Whiplash didn't let up, attacking Izuku again and again in multiple places. His arms, his back, his legs, all were slashed by the energized WHP as Izuku took more and more damage. Armor integrity at 63% the armor announced. Right arm repulsor unoperational. Ah! The latest attack hit Izuku in the helmet, the pain shocked Izuku out of his stunned state and acted fast. Deploy flares. The armor's shins opened up, and flares flew out of them at Whiplash while emitting a bright blinding light. Whiplash flipped backward and to the side, jumping out of the way of the attack but the explosion from the flares filled the building with light. Fortunately, Izuku's helmet filtered out the light. This is my chance. Izuku thought. Increase repulsor power to 50%. Izuku shouted as he aimed his repulsor at Whiplash. Unfortunately, while Whiplash couldn't see anything, he could hear Izuku shouting that he was about to attack at the top of his lungs. Whiplash swatted the blast out of the air and attacked Izuku once more, the WHP hitting the armor's side and sending him flying once more. Izuku grabbed the ground as he was hurling through the air, slowing him down and eventually stopping him as he landed on his knee. Okay. I probably shouldn't have shouted that. Izuku thought. Ranged attacks won't do me any good. If I want to win, I'm going to need to use my strength and speed. And also some tricks. Fire shoulder missiles, Izuku whispered this time as he got up on both his feet. Don't target just fire in his direction. The armor's shoulders rose up and missiles fired out at whiplash. The villain cracked his WHP and swiped at all the missiles, causing them to explode and make a smoke screen in front of him. Suddenly Izuku rocketed out from the smoke, flying at high speed right toward Whiplash. Whiplash barely had any time to react, as he ducked back to avoid the attack. Barely managing to do so as Izuku was so close, their masks touched creating a screeching sound as Izuku flew past his target. Crash! After missing his target Izuku flew straight through the warehouse wall. He managed to stop himself midair before he could go too far past his opponent but before he could turn around, Whiplash's WHP wrapped around Izuku's waist and arms, and pulled him back inside. Gah! Izuku was once again forced to the floor of the warehouse. How much is the armor's durability? Izuku asked as he pulled himself back to his feet. 51% the armor reported. I have to end his fast. If I could just punch him once or twice then that would end it. Izuku thought up a plan. I can't keep flying. I have to stand my ground otherwise he's gonna keep knocking me around. I'll just have to rely on my leftover durability, my strength, and my speed. Izuku ran at whiplash, and the villain retaliated by attacking him with his Izuku tank the blows, opting to let them hit him if he could get closer to his foe. Thankfully it only took a couple seconds to close the distance and get into punching range. Izuku threw a punch at Whiplash, who crouched down to avoid it, and whipped Izuku's side. Gah! Izuku grit his teeth and raised his fist, before bringing it down to the villain, who flipped backward to avoid it and whipped Izuku twice in the face. Ah! Izuku was stunned momentarily from the hits, and Whiplash took this opportunity to strike at Izuku some more, hitting him with attack after attack from his armor in integrity at 24%. His armor started to malfunction as it took more damage. Desperate, Izuku asked, how much power do we have? 79%. The armor announced. Fire uni beam. Izuku shouted. His arc reactor powered up with a strong hum, and Whiplash stopped his attacks as he realized that whatever was about to happen next would be dangerous for him. 
a large beam of energy fired out of the arc reactor, heading right towards Whiplash. The villain barely managed to jump out of the way, getting his armor singed in the process. Izuku turned to hit Whiplash but the villain kept dodging and running away. The uni beam cuts through everything in its way, boxes, crates, the building itself, its support beams. Change the left repulsor from blast to beam. Izuku was going all out, he aimed his repulsor beam in front of Whiplash, cutting him off while the uni beam was catching up. Power down to 30%. His armor warned. Doesn't matter how low my power is if he cuts through my armor. Izuku grunted as he kept trying to hit Whiplash. Whiplash cracked his WHP up at one of the platforms above him and narrowly avoided the two beams. He pulled himself onto the platform, before using his to destroy two more support columns, before leaping out a nearby window. Suddenly, the building began to rumble, and cracks appeared in the walls. Building collapse imminent. His armor warned. Izuka's eyes widened as the building started to come down around him. He fell backward and shouted. Uni beam. Full power. The ceiling started to fall apart, but before it could come crashing down onto Izuku, his uni beam suddenly exploded in power and size, destroying most of the ceiling above and around him. After about five seconds, Izuku's armor shut down. He had run out of power. The rest of the building came down around him, but none fell on him. Leaving him a circle surrounded by debris. I can't move. No. Not like this. Izuka tried his best but without any power, his armor would not move. He heard footsteps approach his helpless form, and soon he could see Whiplash walk up to him, staring down at him. The villain kneeled down to him and simply said. You're no hero. And with that, Whiplash stood up and ran away. Fleeing the scene. Many emotions filled Izuku in that moment. Relief that he was apparently still going to live. Rage at the fact that the villain would now get to run free, still using his tech. But most of all. Despair. At his crushing and absolute loss. You couldn't have waited for backup. As Izuku suspected, Achiko didn't wait long before scolding him, having only just gotten home from the hospital. After his loss, Tamaki found him in the rubble and brought him to the hospital, and after a few hours of treatment he was released. Now he was in his lab, with a very upset Achiko. I didn't think that an A-class villain would show up, Izuku explained while he typed on his computer. Most of the villains I've fought before don't even have rank let alone one that high. Izuku, our tech is the most advanced tech in the world, Achiko stated the obvious. Naturally every villain from the highest rank to the no-names would want to get their hands on it for one reason or another. It was only a matter of time until the guys at the higher level got tired of you taking down their goons and making their lives harder. Izuku paused. I guess. I just didn't think they would go from no names to A rank. I mean it's pretty effective, Achiko said. If they wanted to beat you before you could become more experienced or upgrade your armor. But then why would he let me live? Izuku asked. Because you're more useful alive. Achiko theorized. My guess, and Kaizom's, is that they intended to scare you out of being Iron Man, and hoped that you would eventually take the company out of lockdown and make new tech for them to steal. Izuku scowled. Well, that's not happening. Achiko sighed. In truth, she kind of hoped this experience would stop Izuku from continuing his crusade. But deep down she knew it wouldn't be that easy. You could have died Izuku. Izuku stopped what he was doing for a moment, and turned his chair to face Achiko. That was because I made some mistakes. If I just performed better then I'm sure I would have beat him. Izuku turned back towards his computer. Which is why I'm reviewing the armor's feed to see what mistakes I made so the next time we fight, I'll win. Izuku and Achiko watched the battle from Izuku's armor, while Izuku scribbled down things in his notebook. You're not gonna beat him with just notes. Izuku and Achiko looked at the doorway and saw Kaizom leaning in the doorframe. Kaizom, how long have you been standing there? Izuku asked. Long enough to know you're in over your head. Kaizom walked closer to them and looked at Whiplash. 
This guy's not just a villain. He's a professional villain. Experienced. Maybe a Veno definitely trained. You're not gonna be able to beat him just by not making the same mistakes. And even then I'm not convinced you won't make the same mistakes. You're too inexperienced. Untrained. The gap between you and him in skill is too wide. Izuku looked back at the footage for a few moments. You may be right. So what are you going to do? Achiko asked him. We could get you a trainer. That takes too long, Izuku stated firmly. In that time who knows how many people could be getting hurt by my tech me tesh using my tech. Yes we get it Izuku, they must be stopped. Achiko sighed. No, no that's not what I meant, Izuku said. He's using my tech. So I should be able to use that against him. You mean with the disc? Achiko asked. No, if I tried to use the disc on the assuming he didn't just hit them out of the air, they would be instantly destroyed by the energy pulsing through them, Izuku explained. What I mean is, what if I build an armor to counter his, and what if he has more than just that, Kaizo masked. You of all people should know that anyone worth their salt will have more than one trick up their sleeve. Izuka nodded, thinking deeply about what Kaizom said. I'll have to take that into consideration while building the armor. I'll analyze his quirk and see what other applications I can think of and how to counter them. Thank you Kaizom. I would really recommend combat training, I think you're underestimating its benefits, Kaizom warned him. I'm not. I'm just not underestimating how much time it will take. Izuku said, returning his focus to his work. Kaizom and Achiko gave each other worried looks. Both of them had a very, very bad feeling about this. A week later. Izuku looked at his newly finished armor, looking between it and his blueprints to check for discrepancies. This new armor was different from his old one. It was pure black, except for the white vein-like lines that ran along the entire armor, all connecting to the arc reactor. The chest plate also was a bit bulkier, but not too much so, and the rest of the armor was about the same size. Okay, everything looks good, Izuku said while looking it over. Everything's good. Eri, who had once again acted as his personal lab assistant, asked. It seems so, Izuku told her. After a bit more looking, he stopped when he reached the helmet, noticing something. He picked up the helmet, taking it off the rest of the armor, and getting a closer look at it. This plate is sticking out. That means there's a wire sticking up and that could mean one of the wires is uneven and could snap. And from what it looks like that could mess up the targeting system. Ari hand me my wiring tools in drawer 2C. Ari nodded and moved over the drawers locating drawer 2C, opening it, and taking out some tools, before quickly delivering them to Izuku. Izuku took the tools and sat down, before adjusting the helmet. Eri went beside him, Izuku stopped for a second to help up onto a stool next to him, and watched him work intently. After a few moments, Eri spoke up. Are you gonna beat that scary WHP man? Izuku paused. Yes Eri, I'm altering my armor to make it easier to beat him. How? Eri asked. Well, whiplashes are only dangerous to me because of the energy flowing through them. When they hit or slash me the energy burns through the armor. Izuku explained. Izuku pointed at the white lines on his armor. Do you see these? Eri nodded. These will absorb the energy from the and redirect them to this special arc reactor, Izuku explained. So any time he hits me with the WHP, it doesn't hurt me, it makes me stronger. So you steal his energy like a paraparaparasic? Eri asked. You mean a parasite? Izuka corrected, receiving a nod from Eri. Yes I guess it is like a parasite, where did you learn that? Mommy taught me. She kept yelling about parasites. Trying to steal her happiness and that she was going to do very bad things to them. Eri explained. She also said humans can be parasites too. Like Ground Zero fans. Izuku facebombed. Looks like I'm going to have to have a talk with mommy about what is and what is not appropriate to teach you. Eri gave another look at the armor. Is this gonna be your new armor? Not permanently. 
Izuku shook his head. This armor was made to fight against people who rely on energy attacks. It doesn't have many non-energy based attacks because I had to make room for the absorption system. And the armor is not very energy efficient. That means it runs out of power quickly. Eri pointed out. Yes, it does, very good. Izuku patted her on the head. I probably won't use the armor again after I beat Whiplash, although it should be useful to keep around, just in case. Bear. Bear. Whiplash energy signature detected. Izuku had altered the search and alert system to look for Whiplash's energy signature. Basically, if Whiplash used his quirk, he could track him. This hadn't been the first time Whiplash popped up in the last week, but now, Izuku could finally do something about it. Time to go. Izuku finished up the modifications on his helmet, running back to the armor and reattaching it. Add to the suit up machine, set to prime. The armor sunk into the wall, which closed up as the armor was transferred. Izuku walked over to the circle in the center of his lab, waiting for his armor to be placed on his body. Are you going to fight that strong villain? Eri asked. Yes, Eri. I am. Izuku answered, as the circle lit up, and the suit-up process began. Be careful, Eri warned. And good luck. Izuku smiled, as the machine finished placing the armor on Izuku's body, it powered up and he was ready to go. Thanks, Eri. I will. Fwoosh. Sometime later. The current location of Whiplash put him deep in the forest. Most likely at another warehouse because if there was one thing villains loved, it was warehouses. Izuku flew above the trees, he really couldn't see anything below him. But that was okay because he had all of his scanners and radar on, so there was no way something could take him by surprise. Kaboom! And then suddenly a large rocket flew out of the trees and blasted Izuku. Gah! Izuku cried as the rocket hit him dead on, knocking him higher into the air. Boom! 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 More rockets, capitalizing on Izuku's stunned state, pelted his armor with explosions, knocking him higher and higher into the air through clouds of smoke. Eventually, Izuku managed to get his head back in the game, and dodged to the left. Armor integrity at 91%. His armor announced. Well, at least they aren't doing much damage. Izuku thought as he dodged more rocket barrages. Izuku flew through the sky dodging rockets left and right while trying to scan the location of whatever the source of this attack was. What's going on? I can't get a lock on its source. Gah! Izuku got distracted and was hit in the face with another rocket. H! What's going on? Why can't I detect anything? Izuku thought about it for a moment, before he realized something. They have my tech, they're using my anti-radar tech. Of course, I can't track them. Okay, what do I do? These are most likely coming out of turrets because I'm not getting any heat signatures or any other signs of humans firing these. I could wait until they run out of rockets but that might not be good for my battery. Wait a minute. Izuku thought of a solution. Armor, track where these rockets are coming from, take into account homing properties, wind properties, and my location in relation to their place of origin, Izuku ordered. His armor obeyed his command, scanning the rockets and where they were being fired at, tracking down the source while Izuku dodged more rocket fire. Sources located, adjusting HUD his armor finished after half a minute. Red dots appeared on Izuku's map, allowing Izuku to finally see where the attacks were coming from. Izuku flew straight down, landing right behind a big rock. I can't afford to fly down here. Too many trees, I'll bump into everything. I have to be careful. Izuku looked at the red dots on his map. Ten turrets, I can do this. Izuku stepped out from behind the rock and ran through the forest. He approached the first turret in seconds, and as soon as Izuku got close, the turret turned to him and began to fire. No longer having the air advantage, Izuku struggled to dodge, moving left and right as fast as he could, causing him to trip. Fortunately, before the turret could take advantage of this, however, Izuku managed to shoot a repulsor blast at the turret, causing it to explode. 
Izuku breathed a sigh of relief. One down, ninetieth kaboom. Darn it! Izuku shouted as he was blown away by another rocket. He had been so focused on that one turret, that he didn't notice he entered the range of two others. Izuku rolled out of the way of the rest of the rockets, eventually pulling himself up and running through the forest dodging rockets. Thanks to his speed, Izuku was able to avoid the rockets pretty well, the trees however, despite being completely still, somehow proved to be harder to dodge. Izuku crashed through another tree after dodging a rocket, before crashing through another tree. Eventually, Izuku got close to one of the turrets and blasted it with a repulsor blast, destroying it. Izuku jumped out of the way of more rockets, before unleashing another repulsor blast and destroying that turret too. At this rate, I'll run out of power trying to destroy all these things. Izuku thought. SWCH to beam. Izuku held up his palm in the direction of the nearest turret, which he couldn't see due to the trees but thanks to his map he did know its location. Birrr. Izuku blasted a repulsor beam that cut through the trees until it reached the turret. Boom! The sound of the explosion signaled the destruction of the turret, leaving Izuku to blast a few more. Birrr. 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 Izuku let out beam after beam, making holes in, if not just straight knocking down trees, as he blew up turrets in every direction until finally they were all destroyed. The armored genius let out a small sigh of relief. What is the level of armor integrity? He asked. Armor integrity at 82%. The armor reported. And my power? Izuku asked. Power at 57%. The armor answered. Izuku grit his teeth. This armor's efficiency is really bad. I better find whiplash soon before threat detected, behind you. The armor warned. Crack. Izuku felt a small impact on his armor, but it didn't even budge him. Power absorbed, power at 64%. The armor told him. Whiplash. Izuku turned around, and of course, standing there was the enemy he had been looking for. So that's what you came up with, Whiplash said, looking at his Izuku wasted no time and ran right at the villain, knowing that they could no longer harm him, but could still swat his repulsor blast out of the air, so he had to take a direct approach. Whiplash dodged a punch given by Izuku, the armored man's fist plunging into the cliffside and cracking the rock. Izuku took his fist out of the cliff and kept charging at Whiplash, letting out a flurry of blows at Whiplash that the villain promptly dodged. Same as before, his punches are sloppy, unfocuses, predictable. But DMN strong. And fast. Without my I can't keep him at a distance, or even hurt him. His punches are too fast for me to dodge for too long, eventually, he will. Hit me, and I will go down. Whiplash thought about how to best solve this issue. Whiplash deactivated his quirk turning his into normal metal before he shot out one of his at a nearby tree branch, and pulled himself towards it. The villain landed on top of the tree branch and then jumped away through the treetops. Is he trying to escape? Izuka ran after the villain, knowing darn well that he had no chance of jumping from branch to branch like he did. Instead, Izuka fired a repulsor blast at the tree's whiplash was jumping on, but the villain was simply too skilled. Every time Izuku blasted down a tree, Whiplash had already moved on to another tree, his movements were sporadic and unpredictable, and using his and could swing onto trees that were much farther than he could jump. Soon enough, Izuku had lost track of him in the dense woods. Izuku tried to use his scanners to track him, but nothing was showing and results. He must also be using my stealth tech. Izuku couldn't put into words how infuriating it was to have his own tech used against him like this. It made his BLD boil and his longing to beat Whiplash increased exponentially. Suddenly, Izuku heard a branch snap in half and fall to the floor. Izuku reacted and blasted the spot where he heard the noise, however, nothing was there. He heard another rustling in leaves, and blasted that area, only to hit nothing. He keeps hopping from tree to tree. I need to get rid of these stupid trees. Izuku thought. Blast to beam. Izuku brought his hands out to the sides, before firing the repulsor beams. 
The beams cut through all the trees in their way, Izuku then spun around in the circle. Hundreds of thuds were heard as trees fell all around the forest, clearing a large area around him so he could finally see. Note to self, have people replant the trees in this area. Izuku thought, feeling a bit guilty for the massive destruction of nature. Thwack. H. Izuku was suddenly swept off his feet by a tree trunk hitting him in the back. He still found a way to sneak attack me. Izuku was about to pull himself up and throw the tree trunk off of him when two more tree trunks fell on top of him. Whiplash used his to pick up the fallen trees and throw them on top of Izuku. Soon enough, Izuku was covered in a stack of fallen trees, buried under a mountain of wood. Once Izuku was completely entombed, Whiplash stopped, and waited for Izuku to escape. Then, a blue glow started to emanate from the pile, leaking through the openings between the branches, until, Bjarrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
causing the two to turn to him. I'm repeating myself but what I say needs to be repeated. You're too inexperienced. Kaizom repeated. Even if you have the most powerful weapon in the world, experience almost always beats power. If you did have the experience, you would have known that hunk of junk armor you made was a downgrade in every sense of the word. The parasite armor was made to counter him dash, Izuku tried to say before getting interrupted. It's too situational, Kaizom said. Firstly, you took away his main method of attacking, a good idea, but it wasn't worth the cost. Power is the most important thing about your armor, without it, you are defenseless, so making a suit that uses too much of it isn't a good idea. You could replenish your power by getting attacked, but since his attacks weren't doing anything to you, it's obvious he wouldn't attack. You could have still beaten him if you managed to trap him in close quarters, but you lack any of the necessary combat prowess and training to do that, so any competent opponent could either wait until you ran out of power or retreated, or attack you with other things like trees. Darnith has a point. On paper, the armor sounded perfect. But I guess I was too reliant on the idea that he would be helpless without his Quirko. Izuku suddenly realized why he had gotten that idea. That armor is almost entirely useless, it could come in handy but only in extremely rare circumstances, Kaizom explained. You made a common mistake. Thinking that the tool was a fault when it's the man using the tool that needs improvement. Your old armor was far superior. You need training to beat this opponent. You don't need to be more skilled than him, but you need to close that skill gap enough so your other advantages can win the fight. I'd say a few months should dash, we don't have that much time. Izuku interrupted. They're not gonna stop using my tech until dash, you stop them. You can't stop them if you die. And eventually, Whiplash or whoever is in charge of him, will run out of patience and kill you. Kaizom said bluntly. Boss, I hate to break this to you. But just because you have power now, does not mean you're all might. Izuka's eyes went wide, and he almost seemed to recoil at that statement, before sheepishly composing himself. I know that Dash, don't kid yourself. Kaizom didn't let him finish. I've seen the way you fight. Head on, charging in fist first as fast as possible. You're trying to fight like All Might. But I'll say it again. You, not All Might. You're not that fast, and you're that strong. If you try to fight like him, you will die. Izuku didn't respond. He just stood there looking at the floor. Thinking. After a few moments of thought, Izuku eventually spoke up. I just need to keep working, Izuku said. If I keep working on my armor. Increase the power efficiently, speed up the thrusters. Maybe find a better way to use the unibeam. Then I can do it. But I can't just stop. Kaizom sighed, rubbing his temples to ease the headache that was quickly developing. The bodyguard was ready to keep on arguing with his boss when Achiko stepped in. Kaizom, can you give us some privacy? Achiko asked in her serious, no room for argument, tone. Kaizom looked at her. Her expression lacked the frustration she had before. There were still some there, but she looked more resigned. A little sad even. He didn't fight it. And Kaizom nodded and left the room. Izuku and Achiko stared at each other for a while, Izuku growing increasingly nervous the longer the silence went on. How does she always manage to make me like this? Izuku wondered. Do you remember that time, in the days leading up to the sports festival, when you were desperately trying to make more and more support items so they could get shown off by May during the festival? Achiko asked him. It was during the second year. Do you remember the conversation we had? Izuku spent a moment searching for the memory, before nodding. He knew exactly what conversation she was talking about. It was, as she said, a few days before the sports festival. Achiko had been Izuku and Mei's manager for quite some time at that point and had been friends with him for about the same amount of time. As he was prone to do, he had been overworking himself, even more so with the sports festival looming near. Mei was going to use their gear and show it off during the event, as she had done last year. The chance to show off during the sports festival was not to be taken lightly. 
and so Izuku had really been pushing himself beyond his limit, and that was taking a toll on his body. And Achiko let him know exactly how she felt about that. Several years ago, at the U, support lab. You're overworking yourself. Achiko argued. I, I am fine Yurarika, Izuku said, looking away from her. Midoriya, I can see the bags under your eyes. Achiko pointed to said bags, making Izuku flinch from how close she was. I, 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 a uh, dash, Izuku tried to come up with an excuse, but his panicked state combined with his sleep deprivation was making that rather strong for him. Achiko glared at him. What have I been telling you and May about taking care of yourselves? I swear, I scooped up the best partner out of the support course, and May, but I have to make sure you don't kill yourselves any time I turn around. Izuku cringed with guilt. I am sorry. Achikos gave him a skeptical glare. Does that mean you're going to sleep and take better care of yourself? Well I still need to work on the gear. Izuku stuttered. I need to work harder than everyone else. People won't want to buy support gear made by a quirkless kid, so I need to make sure that everything is top of the line you took a chance partnering with me, I need to do what I can to make sure you didn't make a mistake. Achiko glared softened, before dissipating with a sigh. DMN it why do you have to be so sweet and considerate? Unable to stay mad but not willing to drop it, Achiko decided to try a different approach. If Izuku wouldn't look after himself for his sake then maybe he would for hers. Izuku, this isn't good for either of us. If you're working while sleep deprived then you're going to make mistakes. And that will only make the quality of the gear worse. Achiko pointed out. Don't lie to me and say that it hasn't been getting harder to work on the gear without sleep. Izuku didn't respond, but the look of worsening guilt on his face gave away the answer. Whether I get into the hero course like I want and use your gear, or I stay in the management course and sell it, it's best if it is the best it can be. And that will only happen if you're working on it at 100%. Achiko continued, giving Izuku a pleading look, really hammering in the guilt. And besides. Achiko grabbed Izuku's face and made him look at her. You're my friend. Don't be so considerate and kind, and make me care about you, only to kill yourself by overworking. You can't do that to me. Izuku broke, as did the dam holding back the waterworks. I am sorry. Don't be sorry, Achiko told him. Just promise me you'll take care of yourself. To promise. Izuku told her. Back in the present. You promised me. That you would take care of yourself. Achiko reminded him. Izuku felt the guilt well up in him, and he knew that his resolve was starting to crumble. I. Achiko gave him a sad smile. It's funny, this isn't the first time you threw your health and potentially your life away without a second thought. Caring for you is strong you know. You're self-destructive, you're stubborn as hell, and despite being a genius you can be really dumb when you get tunnel vision. It's strong Izuku, it really is. Izuku was trying really strong not to let his guilt consume him. Every time Achiko really wanted to convince him, she would guilt him. And it almost always worked. Achiko took his hand, the care and warmth put into that gesture, nearly caused Izuku to crumble right there. But I wouldn't have married you if I wasn't up for a challenge, Achiko said tenderly. Because I know that you're worth it. Tears were welling up in Izuku's mind, partially because of guilt, partially because of how touched he was. But you can't do this, Achiko told him. You can't make me love you, help me achieve my dreams, marry me, make me the happiest woman in the world, and give us a child, only to throw your life away. You can't do that to me. To us. He never stood a chance. All of his resolve and will to argue died right there. And once again, he started to cry, but to his credit, it was only a little. Tuvi been being stubborn again. Haven't I, Izuku admitted. I am sorry. I keep making things difficult. I just told you, I'm up for a challenge. Achiko reminded him. I'm just glad you can see reason in the end. Izuku sighed. I'm gonna have to train. Aren't I, yup. Like Kaizom said, at least a few months. Achiko told him. 
and you will be taking breaks. Training won't help if your body collapses, and I don't want you neglecting our daughter during all this. You understand? Izuku said with no small amount of hesitation. He didn't like how slow this was going at all, but didn't really have a choice at this point. I'll go see who I can get as a trainer. Nope, Achiko told him. I'll be taking care of that. As well as your scheduling, because I know you're still terrible at that. I'll get in contact with our hero friends and see who can train you. Also, I'll get our contacts in the police to focus on tracking down Whiplash, next time you two fight I don't want it to be you flying into an ambush. For now, you can work on improving the Model 2 armor, and I'll call Mei so she can work on the armor while you're training. That's Sayuri doing a lot. Izuku pointed out. You just scolded me for overworking myself. Izuku, I'm just making some calls, sending some emails, and writing down a schedule. It's fine. Achiko reassured him. And you're out there risking yourself. I can't just stand on the side sending you disapproving looks, no matter how much I hate this. If we're going to do this, then we need to do it right. And as a team. Like we always have. Izuku smiled at her. I guess I really am hopeless without you. Achiko giggled. I thought that was obvious. Although to be fair I doubt I'd be anywhere near as happy without you. The two of them laughed until they heard a knock on the door. Are you two done making out yet? Kaizo masked. Izuku was about to tell him to come in when Achiko suddenly grabbed him. Not yet. Achiko called, before him right on the lips. Izuku was taken off guard, and by the time he truly realized what was going on, it was over. We can spend more time like that once Whiplash goes down. Achiko teased him. Now let's get back to work. Why yeah? Izuku was too stunned to say anything else. Achiko let go of him, and walked away, opening the door and leaving the lab. Izuku heard a short conversation between her and Kaizom before it ended and Kaizom walked into the lab. You know if there is one thing I've learned from you boss, is that the power of love is real, and it is strong. Kaizom half-joked. Well yeah, Izuku admitted with a fierce blush still adorning his face. Kaizom shook his head with a small smile on his face. I'm glad you're going for training. I've always liked your strong sense of justice, but you can't let it kill you for stupid reasons. Sorry for making you worry. Izuku apologized. Wasn't worried, more frustrated. Kaizom denied. But on a different topic, you know I could teach you a few things. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, how to aim without assistance, and how to deal with armed opponents. Well you'll have to talk to Achiko, she's making the schedule. Izuku chuckled. Meanwhile I guess I'll go get back to work on my armor. Can you go get Eri for me? Gonna have her help you out in the lab again. Kaizo masked. I think she likes it, Izuku admitted. I think she just likes spending time with you, Kaizom said. Izuku paused. Well, another reason not to die I guess. Kaizom shook his head. I guess sir. I guess. Izuku and Nijire were currently standing in a forest. He was in his armor, and she was in her hero costume, and they were both here for the same reason. Flight training. Or to be more accurate, Nijire was here to teach Izuku about flying. Sorry for taking up your time Nijire. Izuku apologized, blushing under his faceplate. It's no problem. It's more than worth it to make sure you don't kill yourself. Nijire said bluntly without losing a bit of enthusiasm or cheer. Hee hee, yeah. Izuku blushed even more. Okay, so first let me see what you can do. Get up there and show me your moves. Nijire instructed. Right. Izuku activated his thrusters and jetted up into the sky. Nijire then proceeded to test his abilities by commanding him to do certain things. Sharp turn. Loop de loop. Fly slow. Now fly fast. Now fly fast and do a sharp turn. This went on for quite some time until Nijire eventually told him to get down. Izuku landed a few feet from Nijire. 
How did I do? Well you have some experience, but it's pretty clear you're untrained, Nijair told him. Your movements were all sloppy and I don't think you could pull off a smooth sharp turn to save your life. If we were in a city you'd probably crash through a whole bunch of buildings. Izuku slouched dejectedly. Oh. Don't worry, don't worry we'll fix that right away. Nijair told him. But first, we need to see how you fly through tight spots. Try flying through those trees, slowly. Izuka nodded and activated his thrusters once more before taking off into the forest. At first, he was doing okay, he dodged the trees relatively well while having a few close calls. Then he hit one tree. Which made him hit another. And another. And another. Until he just kept hitting trees. All while Nijire watched with that ever-present smile on her face. Knowing that this was gonna be a lot of strong work. Later in the gym. Alright let's get this training started. Kurishima said, hitting his hardened fist together. I'm honestly surprised you'd ask me to help me with this. Said Hiro, tail man, Akamashireo Ojiro. The Midoriyas were only somewhat acquainted with the lesser-known hero via his girlfriend Toru. This combined with the fact that as a hero, he was pretty overlooked, made it pretty shocking when Toru told him that they were asking him to teach Izuku hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, you're one of the best martial arts heroes around. Plus you teach martial arts at you, so if anyone could help me with this it'd be you. Izuku explained. Oh. Ojiro blushed a bit, not used to having praise heaped upon him. Well, then I guess I'll just have to do my best. Get in a stance and we'll go from there. You right, Izuku said, as he slowly and awkwardly got into a battle riata pose. Ojiro sighed. He'd seen that type of stance before many, many times. It was the, I watched too many movies stance Ojiro shot Kurishima a look, and the two turned their attention back to Izuku. Try attacking him and see what happens, Ojiro told him. Izuku heard the wording and tone Ojiro used and realized that he was doing something wrong. Despite this, he went along with it, Ojiro was teaching him so he would follow his instruction to the letter. Kurishima had been chosen as Izuku's sparring partner simply because well despite Ojiro having way more skill than Izuku, the sheer gap in defense, offense, and speed capabilities meant that he didn't make a very good sparring partner. Kurishima on the other hand could take a hit from Izuku's armor and dish one back, making him more than adequate for training. He charged at Kurishima and threw out a punch aimed at the hardened hero's face. Kurishima easily deflected the blow with his hardened arm and went to uppercut him in return. Izuku barely reacted in time and moved back to avoid the blow, however, Kurishima noticed that this made his footing unstable, so he crouched down and performed a sweeping kick and sent Izuku to the ground on his back. Ah! Ow! Izuku groaned. It didn't really hurt too much or damage his armor, but it still wasn't a pleasant feeling by any means. All right. Ojiro sighed. Now the real work begins. Sometime later in the gym. Izuku stood, in his armor, opposing his foe on the opposite side of the indoor gym, Kaizom, wielding two connected to a device on his back. You ready boss? Kaizom asked with a vicious grin. I have to be, Izuku told him. Good answer. Kaizom pressed a button, his and the deceit of his life came. To life filling his with blue electric-like energy. Meanwhile on the sidelines, was Achiko and Momo, watching the two of them go at it. Those are designed to mimic the effects of Whiplash's quirk, Achiko explained. And with Kaizom's skill, while it may not be a perfect simulation of fighting against Whiplash, it'll be very close. When he gets better at fighting him like this we're gonna start simulating some different environments so he can get used to dash, Achiko stopped when she noticed that Momo wasn't paying attention to her, and was instead watching Izuku getting absolutely owned by Kaizo. Why are you enabling this Achiko? Momo asked her in a serious tone. Overlooking the fact that you are blatantly exploiting a loophole in the law to commit vigilantism, do you think that just a few months of training can allow him to fight at the level of pros who have been training for years? Achiko sighed. The suit dash is a tool. Momo cut her off. And something I learned a long time ago, is that a tool is only as good as the person using it. 
Achiko glared at her. And what are you trying to imply with that? I dash, Momo paused to choose her words more carefully, not wanting to seriously offend her friends here. Look at him. The two looked at Izuku still fighting Kaizome, making stupid mistakes that he would capitalize on in an instant, leaving openings that would be exploited mercilessly. He's just some people have things that they're good at, and ways they can help people. He's already been doing that with the company. Momo argued. He doesn't need to dash, stop, Achiko told her, shutting the black-haired girl up immediately. Let me ask you something Momo, Achiko said. If I asked you to become a villain, then would there be anything I could say that would convince you to do that? Momo was taken off guard by the question and shot the girl a strange look. No. Obviously not. That, this is that. The same way I could never convince you to become a villain, I could never convince Izuku to stop trying to stop these guys. Achiko told her. But you're his wife. Momo pointed out. Surely they're dash, Momo. Achiko's voice was firm. Do you think I like watching him go off and put himself in danger? Don't you think if there anything I could say to get him to stop, without either ruining our marriage or ruining him, I would have said it already. Momo didn't respond, also not looking Achiko in the eyes. Besides, I know how he feels, Achiko said, the edge that had been in her voice fading. I'm furious about our products being used by villains. I won't rest until I know that tech is out their hands, and back into ours. But it's worse for him. I just sell this stuff, Izuku made it. He put his heart and soul into developing that tech, to help save innocents and stop villains. Having villains use them to hurt innocents, is a spit in the face of everything he's been trying to achieve. He's not stopping. I can't stop him. So if I can't stop him, the only thing I can do is help him succeed. Momo didn't respond. Instead, she just looked at Izuku, getting back up, ready to try again. Days later in the lab. So I've been looking at the interface and the designs, and I realized that it'd be normally impossible for someone to make full use of the armor's speed, Mei told Izuku as the two of them stood over a table with pieces of her armor on it. I mean, it doesn't matter how fast the armor is if the human inside can't control it. Right, if anything it can make fighting harder at times, Izuku said. Yes, yes, so I thought about possibly adding a neural interface in the helmet and back, so that way a person could have their reflexes and reaction speed boosted to be more on the armor's level, May suggested. This could also be used to get rid of all those audible commands that make it obvious what you're gonna do next, as well as a few other benefits. I mean, that would help but it would also cause unbearable headaches and nausea both during and after use. Izuku countered. Yeah, but you could get over that. Mei waved it off, only to get an, are you serious, look from Izuku. No, I'm serious. Mei reassured him. After enough exposure, a person's brain could get used to the interface, and eventually all those side effects would vanish. Izuku paused for a moment, doing the calculations in his brain until he eventually found himself at the same conclusion she was at. But that would take weeks, months of adjustment. Right you are. Luckily, you have that kind of time. Mei told him. Izuku took a deep breath and sighed. Honestly spending all this time not fighting crime was killing him. He knew there were villains out there, using his tech, and he wasn't stopping them. But he couldn't let himself act on these thoughts. He just had to prepare. Weeks later. Izuku and Nijire were back near the forest, but this time Nijire had set up a bunch of targets around the area. Okay, so today we're gonna be working on your shooting, Nijire said. Try shooting something using your aim system thing. Izuku nodded and held out his palm. After a few moments, he fired a repulsor blast at one of the targets, hitting it dead in the center. 20 seconds. Nijire said, you're definitely going to need to improve that a lot or learn how to aim on your own. Try doing it without it. Okay. Izuka knew that 20 seconds was a lot. It didn't seem like a lot of time, but in a battle, 20 seconds could make a huge difference. He kept his palm raised and fired at the target. And missed. Izuka sighed. 
looks like he still had a lot of work to do. A few days later back in the lab. Okay, the neural link should be good to go just put on the helmet, Mei told Izuku, who was standing a few feet away, already in most of the armor except the helmet. Right. Izuku slowly put on the helmet, which latched itself onto the armor. There was a moment of silence, and then Izuku fell over. Oh. Oh. Ah. God. Ugh. Izuku shouted out in agony. My head. Oh. I'm gonna blag. Wait no not the helmet. Mei cried as Izuku vomited inside the helmet. Later that day. Phew. Ah, gah. Izuku was breathing heavily, as he and Achiko ran laps around their extremely large house. Only made worse by the fact that Izuku was carrying Eri on his shoulders. You can do it, daddy. Eri cheered him on. Come on honey. Got to build up that endurance. Achiko told him. She'd been doing this kind of exercise for years so she was fine. With the two of them cheering him on, Izuku pushed past the pain and kept on running. Later that night. The door to Izuku and Achiko's bedroom burst open, as the husband and wife duo walked in, or in Izuku's case, limped in. Once the two had made it in and Achiko closed the door behind them, Izuku unceremoniously fell face first onto the floor. Everything hurts, Izuku whined. I wish I didn't do that helmet test on the same day as the exercise. Was it really that bad? Achiko asked, using her quirk to lift him off the floor and onto a nearby chair. Imagine using your quirk on yourself for an hour, Izuku told her. Ee. -e. Achiko cringed as she imagined what that would feel like. In that case, let me go make you some tea. You're probably really hungry but can't stomach any actual food right now. That's what it feels like. Izuku groaned. Achiko went over to their tea brewing set and started making expensive leaf water, taking great care as she did so. You're doing great, you know. With your training. You're making a lot of improvements. Still doesn't. Feel like it, Izuku answered honestly. I still don't think I'm moving fast enough. You're progressing as fast as you can, Achiko stated firmly. She had been very watchful of Izuku since he started his training making sure he didn't try to overexert himself with extra training like she knew he would if she ever allowed him out of her sight. The room was silent as Achiko poured the tea into a cup and served it to Izuku. This should help with your stomach. She told him. Thank you, Izuku said as he took a long sip of the beverage. Is there any news on Whiplash? He hasn't popped up as often anymore. It seems he's stopped trying to bait you. Achiko reported but we haven't managed to pin down a location. So we have no leads. Izuku frowned, setting down the tea. Unfortunately no, Achiko said solemnly. There was a long pause, as Izuku brooded over the fact that Whiplash was still out, there, somewhere, hurting people with his tech. Achiko put a hand on his shoulder. He won't get away with this. We'll take him down. I feel so worthless, Izuku said, before taking another sip of his tea. Have you seen the news? Achiko scowled. What have I told you about listening to the Nizdot? They think I gave up. Izuku continued. They don't know you, Achiko told him firmly. You never give up when it comes to helping people. Never. They say it's impossible for someone like me to beat Whiplash, Izuku said. Maybe it is, Achiko said. Izuku gave her a shocked and slightly betrayed look. But that's just what you do isn't it, the impossible. Achiko smiled at him and took his hand into her own. People said that your breakthroughs in support gear were impossible. A lot of people would say it's impossible to break out of Yakuza base with nothing but some supplies they hand you and a little girl. But you did it anyway. You're amazing Izuku. You achieve miracles. Who cares what they say? I know you can do this. Izuku didn't react at first, just staring at Achiko in awe, before returning a smile. You always know what to say. Days later in the lab. So I had an idea, Mei told him. 
you've been having a lot of those lately. Izuku pointed out. I can't help it. Ever since I saw this appealing baby my mind has been full of wonderful, wonderful ideas on how to improve it. Mei gushed. I can't believe it took you so long to show this to me. Well I was pretty busy at the time. Izuku defended himself. So what's your idea? So, do you remember the Jarvis project? May asked him. Izuku gave her a confused look. Yes. It was the project to make a semi-sentient AI, to assist in certain tasks in ways that were too complicated for normal AI, but it was shut down because we didn't have a way to efficiently power it out. You're too focused on your armor Izuku. May scolded him. The arc reactor can do so much more than just power a suit. For now, let's focus on Jarvis. If we gather a lot of combat data on heroes and how they act, fight and react, then we could make an AI that can really help you out in combat. That saw a great idea. Izuku smiled as ideas filled his head. Eri. Eri, who was watching from a nearby perked up. Why don't you come with me while I gather footage on heroes, Izuku suggested. We can watch it together. Why yes. Eri immediately accepted. Great. I'll get working on a new arc reactor and the framework. May said. Since it's not going to be portable we shouldn't have to worry about it running out of power for the next century or so. That was the biggest failure of the Iron Man armor. It wasted so much power. If they could find a way to fully optimize the Iron Man armor to work with the arc reactor, then it could power an Iron Man armor for years. This was less because of how much power the armor used, and more because of how new the arc reactor tech was. Having just been created, no one knew exactly how to make the most of this astounding breakthrough in technology, not even the person who created it. It was a miracle he was able to shrink it down and make it portable, however, this portability came at a price. An energy leak. Seeing as the arc reactor had way more power then than what it was powering could actually use, this would result in a lot of that energy leaking out, rapidly draining it until it no longer had any energy. Of course with a stationary arc reactor, they could make new devices to keep this leak from happening. Oh I can't wait. Let's start immediately. May said. A few weeks later, in the gym. Again, Ojiro ordered. Chan. Izuku went to punch Kirishima in the face, who in response, deflected the punch with his hardened arm and went to punch Izuku in the chest. Izuku caught this fist, and pulled Kirishima closer, and then kneed him in the stomach. This didn't do all too much damage to the hardening hero, who smirked in response to this blow. Nice. Kirishima tried to push Izuku away, but Izuku held onto his arm tightly and punched Kirishima in the face. The redhead tried to punch Izuku to get him to release his grip, but Izuku moved his head to the side and countered with a punch to the gut. Enough. Ojiro stopped the fight. Izuku let go of Kirishima, and the redhead started laughing. Man, that suit packs a punch. I actually felt that. Kirishima smiled at him. Are you okay? Izuku asked quickly. Concerned he might have hurt his friend. I'm fine. I'm not a high-ranking hero for nothing. Kirishima told him. You've improved significantly. Ojiro stepped in. You're no MSTR martial artist, but you're just above a novice. Which is impressive considering we haven't been training for that long. Toru was right, your drive is outstanding. Ah oh, thanks. Izuku blushed heavily under his faceplate. But we're not anywhere close to done, Ojiro told him. Now that we've gotten base hand-to-hand -hand combat down, we need to start working in your replicers and thrusters. Right, I knew I could use those in close combat but when I tried doing that before it didn't end well. Izuku sheepishly admitted. Well, that's what practice is for, Ojiro said. Honestly I think Ground Zero would be a better teacher for stuff like this, but when I mentioned it to your wife she refused. Izuku cringed. I can imagine. I don't get the beef between you guys. Kirishima scowled. Seriously, I don't understand why she hates him so much. It's complicated. Izuku sighed. Let's just start already. 
Weeks later, outside. Um, Nijire. Izuku said. Yeah. Nijire smiled at him. What's with all the rocket turrets? Izuku asked. This time, scattered around their usual training area, were many, many rocket spewing turrets. Well, it's time for you to practice dodging while flying. So what better way to help that than with a few dozen homing rockets? Nijire said. Oh and also I'll be flying around trying to hit you. Izuku groaned. He could already feel the pain. A month later Izuku, Mei, and Eri were back in the lab, as Mei and Izuku put the finishing touches on the Jarvis mainframe. All right. Finally. All we have to do is turn it on. Mei said eagerly, before looking at Eri. Want to do the honors? See can I, Eri walked up the console hesitantly. Of course Eri, you helped gather the data after all. Izuku exaggerated. In truth, all she did was sit and watch some hero footage with him, but he wanted her to think she helped. Izuku grabbed Eri and lifted her up so she could press the button on the console. Eri reached out and slowly pressed the button. Bir the system. Booted up, and within moments they heard a British accented voice speak out to them. Hello, I am Jarvis. The computer said. All systems are fully operational. Is there anything you require of me? It works why is it British? Izuku raised an eyebrow at me. Well, it's kind of like a digital butler if you think about it. And you know what they say, not all Brits are butlers but all butlers are Brits. May explained. No one says that, but okay. Izuka moved on, the less he tried to figure out what happened in May's head the better. Jarvis, you should be able to connect to the house, and my armor's systems. Already done sir, Jarvis said. He's inside the house. Eri asked, looking around at the walls. I am part of the house now, Jarvis said. Observe. Suddenly the lab door closed, and then opened again. Various things started turning off and on, showing that Jarvis now had total control over the house. Wow, Eri said. Are you going to help my daddy fight? Young lady, it would be my genuine pleasure, Jarvis responded. Weeks later in the lab. All right, Izuku said as he prepared to put the helmet back on. Let's do this again. He placed his helmet back over his head, as it latched itself to the rest of the armor and locked. The neural link activated, and for a moment, Izuku suffered a terrible headache. But the knit was gone. And it seemed like the world had changed. Whoa! Izuku moved his armored hands in front of him. It was strong to tell from his perspective, if he was moving faster, or if the world suddenly became slower. Looks like the side effects have finally subsided, May said, as she looked for something in her lab coat. Let's test it out. Suddenly, May pulled out a gun and fired it at Izuku. Whoa! To Izuku's surprise, he reached out and grabbed the bullet midair. Success! May raised her arms in celebration. May! Izuku shouted at her. You can't just shoot people. Oh come on, you're worried about that. Your armor is bulletproof. May defended herself. But what if it bounced off and hit Eri? Izuku pointed at Eri who had hidden under the table the moment the gun was drawn. Actually calculating the trajectory, it'd be impossible for the bullet to hit her from where she was sitting, May said. Izuku facebombed and gave a long, painful sigh. Just don't do it again. Later that week. Izuku stood off against Kaizom, wielding both the energized the green-haired man was now equipped with the latest and greatest version of the Iron Man armor. The MK4. The MK-4 was the product of months of R&D complete with Jarvis, a neural link that enhanced one's reflexes, better power efficiency, you ready boss. Kaizom asked, cracking his WHP. You ready Jarvis? Izuku asked the A, I, of course sir, Jarvis said. He will most likely begin with a side swipe followed by an overhead strike. All right, Izuku said. I'm ready. Hmph, raw. Kaizom did exactly as Jarvis said he would, swiping one WHP across and lifting one in the air, 
covering a large area. However, instead of trying to go over the WHP, he allowed himself to fall under it and then used his thrusters to rocket his way towards his employee. Kaizom barely managed to jump over Izuku's charge, and Izuku propelled himself into the air behind him. The bodyguard was about to try and WHP him out of the air, but suddenly Izuku was in front of him and batted the WHP out his left hand. Kaizom backflipped a few times, dodging a few point-blank repulsor blasts, and used the WHP to sweep across the room in an attempt to hit him. Izuku jumped over the attack, and charged at Kaizom, moving so fast that by the time he could see what was coming it was already too late, he had knocked down Kaizom, and kicked the other WHP out of his hand, before keeping his foot on Kaizom to pin him. Ack, nice. Kaizom gave his boss a feral grin. Looks like your training's done. And not a moment too soon. Izuku and Kaizom looked towards the door and saw Achiko running in. Okay, firstly, that was amazing, and secondly, we have a lead. Achiko told them enthusiastically. The heroes captured one of the villains selling our tech, and he's willing to give up some of his friends for a plea deal. Including Whiplash. Izuku's eyes widened. Venus it really time. Achiko nodded with a big smile on her face. That's right. It's time for Iron Man to return. Whiplash. The infamous villain was sitting in his home when he got a call from his employer. Sir, Whiplash answered respectfully. I have received news that Izuku Midoriya is going under intense combat training. His boss told him. Oh. That wasn't good. That wasn't good at all. Will this be a problem? His boss asked him. Yeah, the power of Midoriya's suits is overwhelming. If manages to become at least proficient in combat himself, then I won't be able to beat him. Whiplash answered honestly. One of the reasons Whiplash lasted so long as a villain, was because he knew what he could and couldn't go up against. It was something he learned quickly, as he saw many of his overconfident allies get into fights with Ground Zero with predictable results. Izuku was so much faster and stronger than him, that it blew his mind that he managed to beat him twice, and only did so because his opponent lacked any real skill. I see well then I will need to relocate you until we can find a way to fix this Midoriya problem. His boss told him. You will be housed on one of our factories, on a secluded island. Sir, with all due respect, Midoriya isn't going to let me go that easily. And with their resources, there is a good chance that he or some top-ranking heroes could find me. Whiplash pointed out. Lemillion is still out of the country, and the island heavily defended, you should be more than fine as long as Ground Zero or Todoroki don't show themselves. His boss said. And if they do? Whiplash asked. Then do your best. His boss said simply. You have your orders, are you going to refuse? No sir. Whiplash sighed. I will move on your command. It was just something one had to accept when they became a villain. You always ran the chance of running into a million or ground zero or Todoroki, and then it was all over. All he could do was wait and hope. Present day, with Izuku. Izuku was flying through the air, over the ocean faster than the speed of sound, heading towards the island he was told Whiplash would be hiding on. And he wouldn't just find Whiplash, but an entire factory and shipping facility for his stolen tech. It was practically calling to him, and he was about to answer. Sir, we'll be arriving at the island in one minute, Jarvis told him. I suspect that the island will be mildly or heavily armed, and there is a decent chance that anti-air weapons will be among those defenses. Thank you, Jarvis, Izuku said, as he got ready to dodge. I'll dash a barrage of small missiles incoming. Jarvis warned. Charting optimal course. Izuku saw dozens of red blips on his map pop up, all heading right towards him. And there was a blue line behind drawn showing him exactly where to go. However, he would still have to fly through a bunch of rockets. Hope my training with Nijire paid off. Izuku thought. A few moments, later, the rockets were in sight. Vwash. Izuku burst past them, using his newly enhanced reflexes and training, to dodge the rockets, flying past them and closer to the island which was now seeable. 
Most of it was covered by a huge complex, that was the size of a mall, with a dock located. On the far left. With many large shipping boats floating there. Let's try and hit them before they can fire again. Scan for all defense systems on the island. Izuku ordered his A, I already done sir, Jarvis said as a bunch of blinking red dots were displayed. Thirty rocket turrets were aimed at Izuku, and soon to fire. All right, fire the homing rockets, Izuku ordered as he continued towards the island. Izuku was now flying above the entrance to the island, and the armor's shoulders rose up, and ten rockets flew out and homed in on some of the turrets. Kaboom! The rockets hit, and they destroyed the turrets they hit, as well as some of the turrets that were close to the blast radius. Overall, seventeen turrets had been disabled. Pew pew pew! At the same time, Izuku unleashed a flurry of repulsor blasts at the turrets he hadn't targeted with the rockets, destroying eight more in a flash. The remaining nine turrets fired a flurry of rockets at Izuku. Pew pew pew! Izuku swiftly dodged most of the rockets, while destroying some others, and shooting out some more repulsor blasts at the turrets, destroying the remaining turrets. Is that all the defenses? Izuku asked his A, I, unlikely, Jarvis responded. Although I am not currently detecting any more defenses, that is most likely because of the cloaking technology they stole from you. Izuku grit his teeth, before shaking his head to refocus himself. I can't afford to let my anger cloud my judgment. No again. He looked to the cargo ships. Speaking of stolen technology. Izuku flew over to the boats, hovering down so that way he was directly facing the side of one of them. Jarvis located the engines on these boats. Very well. Done. Jarvis quickly showed the location on Izuku's HUD, allowing the genius to see the engines right through the boats. Izuku aimed his palm at the engine and shot out a repulsor beam. The beam quickly melted through the hull, and pierced the engine, causing it to explode. Izuku swiftly did the same thing to the other boats, rendering them immobile. No escape, Izuku said flying back up into the air. Good job sir, with no escape, you could wait for the heroes to arrive and safely apprehend the villains, Jarvis suggested. Io. Izuku hadn't really thought of that. Without any method of leaving the island, the villains were essentially helpless, sitting ducks. He didn't have to fight Whiplash now. Because he could just wait an hour or so for Ground Zero, Todoroki, Sun Eater, or any other pro heroes to show up and overwhelm them. He felt a profound sense of disappointment and anti-CLMX. His brain searched for reasons to actually enter and fight the villain, and after a few moments, he found some. Well what if they have a villain with a teleportation quirk? Izuku asked his AI, teleportation quirks are quite rare, but given the possible largeness of the criminal organization we're facing, the overall chances of this are too. 37%, Jarvis reported. And the chances that there could be a person with a teleportation quirk that would allow them to escape to shore from this range, is about zero. 0078, well what are the chances of them having some other method of escape? Izuku asked. Without us noticing. 10, 7 percent. Jarvis answered. Sir, are you just looking for reasons to go in? Eyes, Izuku admitted dejectedly. There was a short pause before Jarvis responded again. Sir, if you go in there, the chances of success are 78. 97 percent. Are you telling me to go in? Izuku asked his A, I, in shock. I was built to offer optimal strategies and advice, as such I cannot advise that you take such unnecessary risks, Jarvis told him. What I am saying, is that it is very unlikely that you will perish, and the chances of their escape, is well above zero. So go after him is what I'm hearing. Izuku asked in a hopeful tone. If that is truly what you wish to do, then so be it, Jarvis answered. Izuku looked at the factory and gave it a few seconds of thought. Achiko's gonna be so disappointed in me. Izuku flew over the factory's entrance and landed in front of it. Meanwhile, with whiplash. Birrrrrrr. Birrrrrr. Intruder alert. The entrance has been breached. 
Flashing red lights filled the factory, accompanied by the sound of blaring alarm bells, alerting everyone to the fact that something had gone terribly wrong. Whiplash was one of those people. He had been sitting in his office that oversaw a good chunk of the factory when the alarms went off and the security systems turned on. From his office Whiplash could see blast doors closing, and turrets popping up. These would all be useless if the person invading was who he thought it was. A goon burst into his office, panic evident on his face. Boss. Security reported in. It's Midoriya. He's invading the facility and taking the security and the guards. He's already taken out the boat's engines. We need your help, Sir SHT Whiplash thought, doing his best to keep his calm. Not like retreating to the boats would have been a good idea anyway. Not with him flying around being able to sink them at a moment's notice. But, there was still one option. What's the status of the emergency stealth submarines? Whiplash asked. Well um, no reports about that sir. The goon reported. So we can assume Midoriya hasn't gotten to that yet, Whiplash responded. There was a good chance that Midoriya would now be able to beat him. And his goons wouldn't be able to help much if at all. His only surefire chance would be to avoid confrontation altogether and retreat to the submarine, which should be untraceable. The only issue was that the submarine was six floors below his current location and would take him about 25 minutes to get to. Midoriya's armor could go through this entire facility in five minutes, and the blast doors would only buy him about 30 seconds at best. After a bit of thought, Whiplash had an idea. Perhaps those minions wouldn't be so useless, after all. Tell everyone to arm up, get weapons from the high-quality cargo, Whiplash ordered. Tell everyone to gather upon production floor C, sir are you sure that's gonna work? The goon asked. With those weapons and that many people, definitely. Whiplash lied. He estimated the chance of that actually stopping Midoriya being about 15%. But they would buy time, and waste Midoriya's power. And that's all they were good for. Back with Izuku. Izuku walked through the falls of the factory, his armor getting pelted with bullets from both the turret that came out of the wall and the three goons shooting guns at him. Pew pew pew. With a few repulsor blasts, all the threats were disposed of. The turrets were destroyed and the men were rendered unconscious. He matched past them, and up to the blast doors that were blocking the exit to the hallway. Sir, judging from my scans, this leads onto a large factory floor, about half a mile long, Jarvis warned him and there are about 170 men holding weapons. From what my readings show, they're quite powerful, most likely stolen from Midoriya Industries. Can they damage my armor? Izuku asked concernedly. If there were that many people holding weapons made from his tech, then this could be a real problem. Unknown, but there is about a 60% chance that they could do somewhere between 3-5% to damage, Jarvis reported. Of course that didn't seem like much damage. And it wasn't. However if almost 200 people were shooting at him at once, then even 1% damage it. Way too much. Okay, let me see through this door, give me a complete view of the room and the positions of the men, Izuku ordered. It was time to strategize. Of course sir, Jarvis replied, and Izuku was shown the full layout of the room, and where all the goons were standing. The room was massive, with lots of boxes and conveyor belts on the bottom floor. Up top was a bunch of catwalks. After looking at it for a couple of minutes, Izuka nodded. Okay, time to go. The first issue would be the door. Normally he could get through it with a few good punches, however, after just a single punch, they would be alerted to his presence and have the drop on him. So he'd have to take a different approach. And so, he turned around, and ran back, all the way to the end of the hall, and turned back to face the door. Okay, you can do this, Izuka muttered to himself. Whoosh! Izuka rocketed towards the door, using his thrusters to propel himself at the door at max speed. He raised his fist forward and punched through the door in an instant. Without stopping, only slowing slightly, he charged forward, barreling through the line of goons in his way, and making it to the other end of the room before the goons even knew what happened. 
Izuka rocked up into the air and fired two repulsor beams at sections of the catwalks where many goons were standing, cutting away at their supports and causing them to fall onto the goons below, taking many more of them out. 87 villains removed sir, Jarvis said. It's HT he's here. One of the goons panicked. Izuku had moved so fast that he had taken out the line of goons and the ones on the catwalks before the villains could even register that he'd come in. Open for it. Before the guy could finish his sentence, the armor's shins opened up, and the flares flew out into the air and exploded into a blinding light that engulfed the entire room and stunned the remaining grunts. Izuku landed on the ground, and then propelled himself forward right at the grunts, and took out another line of them, before flying around to take out another line. He then moved up into the air and spun in a circle while letting out repulsor blast all over the place, hitting dozens of goons that were hiding behind the machines. 137 enemies disposed of, Jarvis reported. Gah! Take him down! The remaining goons all opened fire at Izuku, but their aim was sloppy and by now, Izuku had taken out enough goons to make space for him to dodge the bolts of energy coming out of the goons' guns. He still got dinged a few times, taking a bit of damage to his armor. As Izuku did his best to dodge, he let out a hail or repulsor blast at the goons, aiming mainly for the ones who were by themselves. Sht he's too strong! shouted one goon in terror. Izuku then used his repulsor beams, to knock down entire groups with a single swipe. Good sir, only thirteen remaining, Jarvis said. The remaining thugs all decided, F this, and threw away their guns holding up their arms in surrender. We give up. Don't shoot. Izuku ignored their cries, and shot out twelve repulsor blasts, taking out twelve of the goons and sending them to the floor, leaving only one terrified guard remaining. Now! Izuku flew down right in front of the grunt, who fell on his butt in shock. Tell me. Where. Is. Whiplash. A few minutes later, with Whiplash. After all, that time booking it to the submarine room, Whiplash had finally arrived at the subterranean room docking station. Sitting in a large pool of water that led out into the ocean, was three submarines, all decked out with the best stealth equipment they could get their hands on. The room was filled with heavy equipment, as well as crates filled with goods. While the subs were meant mostly to transport goods to more secure areas or to transport extremely valuable goods, they also served for emergency escapes. However, just as Whiplash thought he was about to make a getaway. Birrrr. Kaboom. A repulsor blast flew past his head, and hit the center submarine right in the fuel tank, causing it to explode, and heavily damaging the other two subs in the process. Whiplash watched with dread as his methods of escape sunk before his eyes. Literally. He turned around, and sure enough, Izuku was standing there with his arm raised and his repulsor aimed right at Whiplash. Looks like you were the one running this time, Izuku told him. Inside him, feelings of immense satisfaction, relief, and slight nervousness, welled up. It was time to end this. Whiplash powered up his and hit them against the floor. I've beaten you twice before without taking a hit. If you pick this fight, I'm not letting you leave alive again. It was a bluff. But Whiplash had to get every advantage he could. If he could convince Izuku to walk away, that'd be the best result. Then hopefully he could call for an escape. I'm not the same as I was all those months ago. Izuku told him. I've spent all this time, training, working, so that way I could take you down. Not only that, but this armor is far superior to the other armors you fought. Do you really think that a few months can make up for a difference of years of experience and skill? How arrogant! Whiplash replied. And, your poor family. Wasting all that time doing that when you could have spent it with them. I multitasked. Izuku shouted back. I love my family more than anything. Of course, I paid attention to them. Well if you care about them so much then you should walk. Away. Whiplash replied. Go back to them, and quit the hero CRP. Izuku was about to shout back, but Jarvis spoke up first. Sir, my sensors are detecting perspiration, coming from Whiplash. I believe he is trying to either stall, 
or he is attempting to persuade you to retreat. Judging from what he has been saying, I would guess the latter. My suggestion would be to not listen to him any further. Right, enough talking, Izuku said. Time to end this SHT whiplash thought. Izuku made the first move, charging forward at incredible speeds, with his fist outstretched in an attempt to punch the villain in the face, but Whiplash barely managed to avoid the blow by ducking under it and then flipping over to the side. Before Whiplash could start attacking, Izuku unleashed a volley of repulsor blast at Whiplash, forcing the villain to keep flipping while flailing his to avoid and block the blast. Izuku zipped behind Whiplash and kicked his side. Ack! Whiplash was sent flying by the power of Izuku's attack, getting sent through one of the crates. I hit him. Izuku celebrated with elation. I finally hit him. Good job sir, but focus on the battle, Jarvis told him. Sorry. Izuku quickly got his head back in the fight and flew over to where Whiplash had flown. But when he flew past the destroyed crate, he didn't see the villain. Judging from how strong he was stuck, his velocity, and accounting for the weight of his equipment, he should have landed here. Jarvis made a highlighted circle on the ground, showing the area where Whiplash should have been. Well then where is he? Izuku asked, staring at the spot Jarvis pointed out. Behind you. Jarvis altered. Ha! Huh. Izuku turned around, and just managed to see the WHP coming at him in time to fly to the left and dodge it, and then fly up to avoid the other WHP swing. Whiplash was standing on a stack of crates, and Izuku could see that his kick had left a serious dent in Whiplash's armor. Izuku raised his palm and let out a repulsor blast at Whiplash, but the villain backflipped off the crates and dodged his attack. DMN it. How is he still dodging me? I'm moving at speed so fast he shouldn't be able to react. Or at least react this well. Izuku asked in frustration. A theory, sir. Perhaps he is listening to the sounds of the armor, in order to predict your attacks. Jarvis suggested. The sounds of my armor. Izuku's eyes widened in realization. Of course. My repulsor and thrusters all make loud noises before they activate. Indeed sir, I would suggest you forego using your thrusters and repulsor, it would also help conserve your armor's power which is currency at 45%, Jarvis advised. Also watch out on your bottom right. Izuku was more ready for it this time and dodged an overhead WHP swipe from Whiplash, who was hiding behind another pile of crates. After his attack failed, Whiplash retreated back behind the crates and out of sight. Izuku flew right through the crates, cutting the villain off before he could hide again, before dropping to the floor in front of him. Whiplash tried to raise his left WHP up to attack him, but Izuku had already zipped right in front of him and smacked the WHP out of his hand. Izuku moved his fist forward, right into Whiplash's chest, making a huge dent in his armor and forcing the villain to go flying once more, this time into the water. Wait, Jarvis, will his equipment electrocute him? Izuku quickly asked the AI, no sir. Do remember that he is using your equipment, which you have made thoroughly waterproof. Jarvis reminded him. Oh, yeah. Izuka blushed with embarrassment at having forgotten that. Anyway, I'm going in. Izuka ran towards the water and dived headfirst. And almost immediately after submerging, he had the whiplash's WHP wrapped around him. What? Izuka cried out, as his armor started taking damage. This didn't last long, however, and Izuku grabbed the WHP, no longer caring about the damage it did to him, and ripped it out of Whiplash's hands, cutting off its connection to his quirk. Now with the WHP doing no damage, Izuku took the WHP off of him, and then threw it aside, and looked turned up and behind him to see Whiplash attempting to swim away from him. Izuku activated his thrusters, and flew up, grabbing Whiplash as he made his way out of the water and into the air. He threw Whiplash onto the floor, strong. Making the WHP wielder gasp as he got the wind knocked out of him. Izuka dived down and delivered a solid blow to Whiplash's face. And then he brought down his other fist for another, and another and another. All the months of frustration were now being taken out on the person who had caused it all. 
After a few more blows, Izuku stopped. He looked down at Whiplash, and at his work. His mask had been torn off, and his face was now bruised and bloody beyond recognition and he was definitely unconscious. You've won sir, Jarvis told Izuku. Congratulations. Izuku took a moment to let that soak in before a huge smile broke out on his face, and he raised his arms to the sky in victory. Yeah hi, 